This lecture has been made available to you courtesy of the American Numismatic Society. My name is Peter Van Elfen, as most of you know, and um, I have a number of hats that I wear, chief curator here at the American Numismatic Society, but um, in recent years, I've also been a member of the Citizens Coinage Advisory Committee at the United States Mint, and um, this year I've been serving as chairperson of that committee. And um, as uh, many of you may know, that the the Mint um, has a number of on-staff engravers and artists, but in addition, they also have what is called the Artists Artistic or Artist Infusion Program. And this is a program that brings in uh, non-staff artists into the Mint's orbit, as it were, and allows them then to uh, design coins or at least um, uh, pr propose designs for uh, various coinage that the uh, CCAC will typically review and then recommends these designs to the Secretary of the Treasury. So um, our speaker today, Justin um, Luntz, is in fact one of these artists uh, that, has, or Kuntz has been a member of the Artist Infusion Program for a good number of years um, and in fact has designed uh, some award-winning coins for the United States Mint, including one of my favorite recent U.S. coins. This is the American Liberty coin from 2017. Um, Justin is a, a professor, assistant professor in the Department of Visual Arts at Brigham Young University in my native state of Utah. Um, he is a painter, a concept artist, illustrator, teacher, and he has worked um, in a number of different media, including uh, game development for studios and has worked for Disney Interactive and Blizzard Entertainment and so forth, and so is very well versed in a number of, of different media and um, art uh, styles. So uh, without further ado, I'm happy to turn it over to Justin and let him tell us about his um, uh, adventures in metal, designing coins um, for the Mint and, and elsewhere. So Justin, all yours. Great, thank you, Peter. That was a very generous introduction. I'm gonna go ahead. So hello, everyone. Uh, and greetings from the Rocky Mountains. I'm very honored and, and delighted to be asked to speak today. This was not on my bucket list of or, or goals. So uh, I feel it's it's a particular honor that, that I wouldn't have aspired to, to be able to speak to you. And I hope uh, I can share some of my thoughts and feelings about what it's meant to me to play a small part in American numismatic design for the past 20 years or so, and to be part of this collective effort to give enduring visual form to the shared ideals, the influential personalities, and the defining events that constitute the American experience. I should confess up front that I never intended to become a numismatic artist. I was busy pursuing a career as a painter, illustrator, and concept artist in the video game industry when I first heard about a thing called the Artistic Infusion Program. I had been exploring ways to get involved with public art in the hope that I might be able to create something that could be long lasting and his potentially historically significant, like a mural for a community library or an airport. But I don't think it had really occurred to me that I might be able to design coins and medals for our nation, not until the opportunity actually presented itself. As a kid, I, I looked at coins, I was interested in them and I collected them, but it didn't seem like something that I could do for a living, you know, to make them. So it has been my privilege to join this happy association with the United States Mint and my fellow AIP artists for more than 15 out of the past 20 years. Let me make sure I have the next slide here. Did the slide advance? Yep. Okay, good. So I was still young and a bit uh, overwhelmed and probably pretty naive as a new member of the Artistic Infusion Program. And, I felt a deep sense of gratitude each time uh, my, my contract was renewed or when one of my designs was reviewed favorably. Along the way, I've had the good fortune of seeing a number of my designs endure the gauntlet to be recommended and selected for minting. It's been a very special experiences, experience for me to see the images of my mind and the work of my hands become part of such a remarkable and complex production involving so many people at the top of their field. And this is just kind of how I imagine 
things, you know, coins are made. Although I have been to the mint and I've seen the process, it's still a little bit confusing to me. Um, I've realized that the numismatic world is a little bit like the NFL, except with somewhat more artistic and historically inclined audience, complete with its own set of players, coaches, producers, pundits, chroniclers, statisticians, fans, and even a few armchair quarterbacks. In this analogy, the artists are like the players who practice, train, and compete chasing after that elusive football of committee endorsement and popular reception. Though our audience may be fewer in number and our comp compensation somewhat less than that of a professional footballer, I believe we experience no lesser degree of passion, agony, and ecstasy. Usually what, we, what it feels like is fumbling the ball or being sacked, but sometimes on rare occasions, we luck out and we score our version of a game-winning touchdown. Though the world's view of artists may be slightly dubious and tinged with suspicion or perhaps pity, the life of an artist is full of struggles and setbacks, highs and lows, yearning and occasionally accomplishment. In the end, just like everyone else, we are the protagonists in our own story, striving to use the knowledge, the gifts and experiences we have to make an impact for good on the world. So today I'd like to share uh, some, some thoughts on a few design, few of the designs where I managed to make a lucky breakaway into the end zone. I view these cases as a team effort rather than an individual accomplishment, a collaboration between the good people of the Citizens Appointed Advisory Committee, the Commission of Fine Arts, and the Office of Design Management at the Mint, the Sculptor Engravers, and the entire staff really at the United States Mint. First, I'll give some background on my participation in the Artistic Infusion Program and provide a brief overview of the coins and medals produced by the US Mint featuring my designs. Then I'll talk about my process and end with the making of, of a few different designs. I'm gonna show some designs that have not been minted. And generally we keep these kind of on the down low um, because these were not selected and the Mint doesn't wanna create confusion, but I think these are old enough and, and this, this audience is, uh, you know, small enough that I can I can share these. The Mint has approved me sharing these with you, so um, you'll see that little note at the top that these are designs not minted. And some of you who have been on the CCAC uh, may recognize some of these. Uh, I don't know. So in the first three years or so of my affiliation with the AIP, I submitted designs from a number of different programs, but nothing made it through the reviews. I was growing discouraged, thinking maybe I just wasn't cut out to be a numismatic designer. Then I had a review with John Mercanti, uh, the chief engraver at the time. As we looked at my portfolio of designs, <clears throat> he began to give me some pointed critiques. I told him how I was feeling, that I was actually thinking about resigning from the program so the Mint could find a better artist to take my place. To my surprise, he complimented me on some of the designs and encouraged me to keep going and just be patient. He said, nobody really figures out what it takes to create successful designs right away. It's a learning process and it takes, it takes time to get a sense of what works and what doesn't. He also emphasized that there is a fair amount of luck involved even after all of our efforts. So I continued working full-time in the game development field while doing numismatic design and other freelance illustration work on the side. Not long after that review with Mercanti, I found out one of my designs had been selected for the 2008 Andrew Jackson's Liberty first spouse gold coin. So this is my first minted coin, I believe. And this was huge for me. This is a half ounce gold. I don't know if any of you have this in your collection, but I quickly bought two of them and then got permission from my wife later. <laughs> but I had to have this coin because this meant a lot to me after a few years of, of submitting designs. The next year, my portrait was chosen for the obverse of the 2009 Abraham Lincoln commemorative silver coin. And this, this went on to sell nearly half a million coins, which really was impressive to me. So seeing these two coins minted, um, you know, two years in a row was very gratifying and, and validating for me after enduring so many rejections. It felt like I was starting to find my voice with these sort of straightforward heroic portrayals of of men who shaped American history. Around this time, I enrolled in a graduate MFA degree program, Master of Fine Arts in Painting at Laguna College of Art and Design in California. 
it's not entirely clear what motivated me to do this because I was earning a good living in the game industry by then and things were heading in the right direction with my freelance work. But I really wanted to keep learning. I was curious and I wanted to find out what I was capable of as an artist. And my wife was supportive, but trying to give my best efforts to my employer, meet my freelance deadlines and care for my growing family while attending a graduate program part-time, uh, it meant that something had to give. So I began fearing I wouldn't be able to do my best work in the time uh, allotted for these design assignments from the Mint. And I began to start uh, declining those invitations. Eventually they let me know they wouldn't be renewing my contract due to the lack of my lack of participation, but they said I had done good work and they encouraged me to reapply when I graduated and became more available. I hoped I could return to active status in the program at some point, but my graduate work would take four years going part-time. So I didn't really have any idea what the future would bring. I graduated in 2011 and shortly thereafter was offered a full-time faculty position at Brigham Young University where I continue to teach today. In the spring of 2013, I received an email from the Mint requesting some ad hoc designs on a short timeline and offering me a temporary contract <clears throat> on the basis of my past performance. Um, so they were kind of recruiting me back, which was exciting. And, I, and within a year, I formally was readmitted to the Artistic Infusion Program. Um, <clears throat> I've continued my service for a, a decade or so since then, and and seen about 20 more of my designs selected for production by the Mint. It's really been a, an amazing ride. So I'm gonna share a few of those selected designs or as many of them as I can, because a few of them still haven't been unveiled publicly, but I'll, I'll go through these. And, and feel free to stop me if you have a particular question about these. I, I have some questions or some time built in for questions later if you want, but this is kind of the list. So the 2014 Civil Rights Act of 1964, commemorative silver coin, obverse. Uh, Rosebud Sioux Code Talkers. I have this one right here, actually, in my hand. Congressional Gold Medal, obverse. Uh, another Code Talkers. I have that, that one right here, too. <laughs> I keep these on my desk because I, like I like to just hold them. <laughs> uh, this one was for the uh, St. Regis Mohawk tribe, the Aquasasne. 2015 American Liberty High Relief Gold Coin and 2016 Silver Medal Obverse Design. America the Beautiful Quarter for Shawnee National Forest, Illinois. Reverse. 2017 American Liberty 225th Anniversary Gold Coin, Obverse. This is the preamble to the Declaration of Independence, American Eagle Platinum Proof Series, uh, representing life, liberty, and the pursuit of happiness on the Obverse. 2020 Naismith Memorial Basketball Hall of Fame coin. This one is a lot of fun. Uh, Weir Farm National Historic Site reverse. Um, this one meant a lot to me as an artist because it's about an artist and, and the place that he left behind. Uh, this is the obverse of the American Innovation $1 coin, which is part, you know on the entire series beginning in 2018. And I have a couple of reverses, uh, the 2020 South Carolina American Innovation $1 coin with Septima Clark. Uh, 2022 Vermont American Innovation $1 coin with uh, snowboarding. Also uh, got lucky enough to have one of my Negro Leagues baseball uh, 2022 half dollar coin designs selected. And re most recently the uh, Ghost Army Congressional Gold Medal uh, was, was announced. The thing that was special for me about this one was having my design on both sides. So I, I have the obverse and the reverse. And I just love the way this turned out. I think that about covers the, the list. And so I can pause and take a few questions if there are any. Yeah, if we have any questions, um, please do ask. In fact, I'm, I have to say, I wasn't fully aware of how many designs you do have. Um, on coins and, and medals as well. And um, I'm certainly aware of a number of them, but uh, hadn't realized the full, full extent of that. So very good. Um, so Justin, um, the 2017 design, mm -hmm. the gold, um, yes. which is like one of my absolute favorites that we ever did. Um, there are 11 people on the committee 
and the top vote that you can, the top number you can assign to a design is three. Mm -hmm. So a perfect score becomes 33. Can and that, that, that happened? Yep. <laughs> That's amazing. Um, yeah, I, I was really blown away. This uh, I'll talk about this one actually as part of the presentation later, but um, the reception of this was just fascinating to me to watch in real time. Um, it, and it went on to receive the uh, Krause uh, yes. Gold yes. Coin of the Year Award in 2019, which was just, mm -hmm. that's another thing that I would have never dreamed I could do. And so, yeah, um, this one is probably my greatest hit. <laughs> you know. Well, you I agree. To, I totally to agree. Great question, thank you. And I'm honored that you, to hear that. So well, I'll go on. Um, if yeah, I was just gonna ask Justin, so you, you, um, you'll you be talking a little bit more about uh, approaches to numismatic design. And, In fact, yep, that's my very next slide yeah. here. <laughs> yeah, good, because um, there we go. Yep, very good. So I made an acronym because it helps me remember kind of what my process is. Uh, and I and I, I teach this to students, so you know, and and really every every artist has to kind of adapt. They can, it's hard to just take a template cookie cutter process and apply it. You everybody works so differently, but I this is a, a kind of a general procedure or process that I follow with really any design assignment. Um, so I'm going to give you a brief overview of this process and kind of apply it to uh, one uh, to the Ghost Army Congressional Gold Medal. And then I've got a couple more examples I can share depending on the time. So this, this process is, for me, it's based on the need to recognize the nature and anatomy of a, per, of a particular design problem and to understand and empathize with my audience to clearly define the problem that I need to solve and to generate a large number of solutions by sketching, prototyping, and so forth, to test and analyze those concepts and then implement the best solutions. So this isn't just for numismatic design. I, I'll use this process in a lot of ways. I'll just go through these briefly here. Um, anyway, I, I apply these ideas to, to the Ghost Army Medal, which I'll show you in a minute, and kind of give an example of how I apply each step. But I would say this is kind of a basic abstraction of the major stages in the process. I don't always follow these steps in order, and sometimes I have to go back to square one and start over. But the more intentionally I engage in each step, the more confidence I have that I will arrive at a good original design. So this is just a little more information about what these terms mean for me. All right. So we'll talk about this in the context of, uh, of this process. I believe research is essential, um, especially when it comes to a historical subject because history is so surprising and it's never quite what we expect it to be, right? So that usually starts with reading the design brief provided by the Mint, which they, they do a great job boiling down the, the core concepts. Um, so it's very helpful. And then I also usually will read the legislation just so I know kind of where Congress is coming from and what, what that coin or medal needs to be, um, especially if it's a new program and I'm not familiar with, with the legislation that brought it into existence. Uh, and what I really try to understand is the core idea, like what is the message uh, that, that needs to be conveyed here, right? What do I need to communicate? Once I have a clear sense of the requirements and criteria for the designs, I approach my work more or less as a visual problem solver. And before I go much further with research and load up my mind with information, I'll typically do some initial sketching just to capture my first impressions and intuitions. And this is where, what I call ideation, or in other words, idea generation. And these can be very vague, very rough sketches. It's just to get the pencil moving, to start making some shapes, um, and to really imagine and explore and make note of as many unique and different ideas or directions as possible in a short time frame, because it's, it's about exploring kind of a range of, of ideas. I do find sometimes I'm, I get hung up on a particular idea early on in the process, and I have to actively push myself to try different things. And so later I'll give a little more example of that, but in this brief example first, um, I'll just take you through that. I try to remember to trust my gut feelings and rely on my intuition as much as possible. Um, 
to, to guide me to the best ideas without really overthinking them. Um, some, pe some people call this brainstorming, but for me, this stage typically involves drawing little thumbnail sketches as you see here. And they're usually not very pretty and they actually take more time than you might think just by looking at them, just because of the thought and consider consideration that has to go into them. And, and oftentimes the iteration, right? Because what you don't see here are all the sketches that I erased before I arrived at these or the pages that I've gone through, um, scribbled out and so forth. As I draw, I try to suss out which ideas have the greatest aesthetic potential and conceptual potential. And often I'll put a little star on those um, or other notes next to the ones I like best. And then I'll begin to sketch variations based on those. These sketches also give me an idea of how busy or how simple or how crowded the design is going to be. And that was one of my concerns with this because I was trying to put so much in that obverse that, um, you know, it started to get a little cramped. <laughs> so I had, that was a new problem I knew I had to solve. Um, I use this little circle template just to make sure my sketches are starting out at the approximate diameter the final coin will be minted because those first sketches, I want them to be the, the same scale as the coin or metal. Um, this helps keep, keep me from overcomplicating the design when it's a small coin. And it also encourages me to play with the space available in a, in a larger format, like a metal. And so I end up with pages and pages of these little circles in my sketchbook. Okay, do you see the tank there? Just want to make sure my slides are keeping up. Yeah, we see the tank. Okay. So once I've exhausted my own initial store of ideas, I'm ready to do some additional research. And I never know what's quite, quite what's going to turn up in that effort. So I try to keep an open mind and think about how I might apply the things I find. Sometimes solutions appear where we least expect them. So I've learned that you know necessity is the mother of invention, but I think serendipity is the father. So we have to be open to the, the accidental discoveries, right? Um, some of my research involves further reading, but if usually if there's a good historical audiobook or documentary film available on the subject, I always prefer to study that way because I can sketch while I listen to it. So the research I'm doing is mainly visual and that involves gathering and studying images. I typically start with any photographs that have been provided by the Mint or the program stakeholders, followed by whatever I can find on the internet. Sometimes I use uh, digital libraries and collections like ArtStore, which is now part of JSTOR. And when there's a lot of material available on the subject and it's difficult to find the good stuff, or even when I'm just short on time, I actually enlist the, the help of a research assistant, typically one of my students, and they, they can help me sift through images, you know, um, and find the best and most relevant things. These images serve both for inspiration and informational purposes. And though I do have to take care to avoid copying them too closely because of concerns about copyright and originality. So these, these were some that I found for the ghost army. You get to see you know, the things that they did, the things that they made. Well, so my next round of sketches usually involves somewhat larger, more detailed drawings as I'm working toward a final design. And I've come to think of observation as its own step in the process. And this reminds me that it's not enough for an artist just to look quickly and casually at the things we discover in our research or that we encounter in the course of our lives. We need, to, instead we need to examine the world deeply and we do that by drawing. In its practical application, observation uh, means doing studies from life or photographs I've taken and collected and it can also mean creating 3D models based on those images using software applications like ZBrush or Maya. So these are a couple examples of models I made for this program um, based on the photographs, but having a 3D model allows me to position this from any angle and draw it with a lot of accuracy, right? I wanted these uh, patch emblems to have a little bit of depth and relief in the metal. And so I, I modeled those out. And th again, that allows me to put them in any position and sketch them based on the 3D model. Uh, because so much of my work is figurative, figure-based, I will almost always work with models and, and I hire people I know or professional models, oftentimes costumes, uh, props, that sort of thing. And I'll supplement that reference material with you know, um, stock photographs or images from, from my research like this telegraph 
or like this uh, this helmet, right? Things that I may not have on hand, but I can kind of what I call Frankenstein together or patch together. It's sort of almost like collaging, but with with the drawing, right? I'm borrowing these supplemental images, and and they add that sense of historical accuracy um, and realism to the designs. And you know, if I don't have the actual object there, sometimes we have to use a sofa or something. But you can start to see how the sketches become, you know, sourced from some of these photographs that that I'm taking with with my models. Um, I really prefer to work from my own photographs as much as possible, both because I have greater artistic control and authorship as kind of a director or photographer. So I, so I get more of an original design, but also there's copyright implications there. So as, if I'm doing more of the process, then it's more really my design. All right, so I, I'm gonna show you these draft designs. These are not final designs. Um, how are we doing on time? Oh. Okay. Anyway, um, let me say one more thing about observation. I think it's, although I, I treat it as a step in the process, I think it's um, it it's part of everything I do. It's it's really the nuts and bolts. My drawings are largely the result of good observational efforts, and I don't think the drawings would be as good or as interesting without that observation. Um, and so it's not just a step in the creative process, but I think of it as more of a general way of thinking that I try to cultivate and practice um, at all times. To become habitually observant, I have to actively notice and consider and question and ponder, reflect and remember. And uh, often you'll find me just sort of staring into space and thinking. <laughs> and, and I promise you there's something going on. Um, it might not be what's, uh, what's currently being discussed, but, uh, but I, am, it's, I think that's part of my ongoing creative process. Um, but it, that's something that's kind of hard to do these days. It, it takes time and it takes attention and we never seem to have enough of those in the world that we live in. So I've come to kind of the halfway point roughly in the process typically when I start to consider everything I've learned and co collected and assembled, the sketches I've done, and I start to piece them together based on the, the thumbnail sketches. I'm looking for patterns and relationships between the different elements and starting to develop those finished drawings based on the ideas that, and enhanced by the observations. And I, I always feel like if I've followed a good process, I can have some confidence that good solutions will emerge, right? Um, but my first decisions are always sort of tentative and subject to review. So I start placing the drawings into, into a, a composition, into kind of a template with, with a circle and a mask. And in some cases, to save time, just to see an, a, an idea before I spend the time to really draw it, I'll do all the drawings, I'll, I'll make a quick mock-up. And that might just be using photographs or 3D models or some clip art or something. Like the one on the right here is an example where I threw in some leaves um, around the fringes of that just to see how that would look. I didn't, I ended up using stars instead there, but but that gives me kind of a quick general idea of what the design might feel like before I invest more time in finishing that. And I usually have enough information by this point that I can proceed to the final execution of the drawings, the typography. And, but if, you know, if the time permits, I, I often will jump back to a previous step and develop additional ideas, multiple solutions whenever possible, right? So I have more options. Um, once I have all those pieces in place, I'll take some time to design, to analyze the designs and subject them to my own critique. Also bounce them off my wife and other people I trust just to get a second set of eyes on them. And then I try to put them away for a little while um, and let my brain kind of cleanse and, and clear out and reset. Try to get my mind on something else and come back fresh to sit with the designs a little bit longer. I'm trying to, to see if they've coalesced into something that feels like what I had originally imagined and if I can picture what they would look like rendered in metal. So that's really important too. This is why I say stories in metal because I know that's the final medium for these. And one of the important things here is that just to remember that the designs aren't necessarily good just because they're mine, right? And it requires some objectivity, right? Letting go of my ego, focusing on the task more um, with as much objectivity and dispassion as I can. 
At this point, I'll usually make a few revisions and refinements to address any issues that may be nagging me and potentially go through a few different iterations or alternate designs to compare. But to, to be honest, you know, by this point, usually the deadline is so close that I've just got to get it done. <laughs> so um, here's, here's some more of the reverse draft designs. You, you can see that I didn't change that one on the left very much. And I, I think I submitted the one on the right as an alternate also more of a traditional solution with the, with the type there. Um, and, and I'll always receive feedback from the Mint. They always have some feedback on those first round designs after their reviews internally for legal, technical, coinability, and artistic uh, feedback. And usually there's some additional feedback from the outside uh, stakeholders. And of course, I'll make revisions based on that feedback. Um, in this case, do you see the one on the left was an attempt to simplify the design because it felt a little busy. Um, for me, I, I wanted to have all four of the different types of deception that the ghost army used. And so, although I like the simplicity of the design on the left, I felt like it wasn't fully representing all the kinds of things that they did. So I kind of went back to that uh, a little bit more detailed design. Ultimately, the hope is that um, these designs pass the, those, re if they pass those internal reviews, that they could be minted, right? If they're selected, that there wouldn't be any foreseeable problems with uh, technical or legal or other issues. And we hope as, as designers that if we've done our due diligence as creative problem solvers, that the designs we end up with will not only be acceptable, but truly fresh, new, and original, and appealing. Um, I like to remember that creativity doesn't demand that I come up with something completely unknown or novel, um, but that in fact many audiences won't even accept ideas that are too far outside the realm of familiarity or tradition. So originality, as I think of it, is actually kind of a nuanced thing. The, the level or degree of, an, of novelty that an audience will embrace seems to be found most often in that margin between the everyday and the bizarre. Um, so those are the those are the final approved designs. I do have a short video if we want to. I'm going to try to roll that. Uh, this was produced by Brigham Young University, and they did an interview. And uh, I'll go ahead and play that. Oh wait, maybe back it up. <laughs> I'm a full-time faculty member in the Department of Design at BYU. I teach illustration. I'm also interested in the United States and, and our history. The United States Mint is unveiling the designs for the Congressional Gold Medal for the Ghost Army in Washington, D.C. at the U.S. Capitol. It was very surprising to me that, that both of my designs for the front and back were ultimately selected. The Ghost Army was a tactical deception unit during World War II, and they used creative means and methods to create illusions of actual army units at scale in the field. They were in danger. They were under fire at times. And this is a great example of, of a real service that creative people performed to save lives. You can see these soldiers doing different things. Morse code, how they would use radio for illusions. Sewing a patch on his uniform and changing their insignia. A speaker system, they would play the recordings loudly on the battlefield to simulate actual sounds of you know, bridges being built or uh, tanks moving, that, that sort of thing. But it was all pre-recorded. And in the background, you see this tank, which is actually not a real tank. It's an inflatable tank figures carrying it, one on each corner. On the reverse side of the medal, I have the patch emblems of the Ghost Army. I was honored and thrilled to find out that the representatives of the Ghost Army were so happy with the designs. And I really related to the Ghost Army because so many of them were artists in uniform. They're out there making cool stuff, but it's for a purpose. You know, it's, it's for a life-saving purpose, which is awesome. Okay, so uh, I can pause just for a minute if there are any questions. 
Actually, um, Justin, this is Peter. I, I'm actually fascinated by your process, um, in, in part because I'm always wondering how artists, not not just uh, working with the U.S. Mint at the moment, but over the course of history, you know, designing uh, numismatic obverse, reverse uh, designs, types, and so forth, you know, how, how they work. And I, I do recall when we on the CCAC were reviewing the designs for the Ghost Army Medal, um, you know, as, as somebody who is very interested in World War II history, and as, as a kid built a lot of models of Sherman tanks and things of that sort, you know, I was assuming that, um, say, in, in the case of your designs, that you were just simply using photographs of, you know, period photographs, but the fact that you're you're actually using models and uh, you know contemporary models and taking your own photos, you know, really is fascinating. You know that um, that the process that I assumed is not the process that is actually being used. You know, in in this case. So, no, I, I think you make a good point. Those historical photographs are this kind of the starting point, and and I for me they are actually a huge part of like, you know, but I consider them research, right? Um, and, and but since I'm talked about the goal is to be original right to create something fresh and so I'm always trying not to rely on those historical photographs too much I mean there may even be copyright issues there so yeah it's the recreation oftentimes very similar or, or very much inspired by those historical photographs but you know if you go back too far we don't even have photographs right we, we have paintings we have other artistic representations so really, there is that level of imagination where we kind of have to fill in the gaps and, and bring a fresh take to it. So that's for me, that's it's worth it to go to the trouble of finding models. I know I, I don't have a giant budget, so I can't, you know, go to the level of Hollywood in, in all these cases. This is why I have to kind of weave together different reference sources in the drawings. You know, and one one other thing too, the the alternate version that you showed us that uh, did not include the half track, um, you know, that that was a little less busy, a little more simple, um, was also interesting because you know my, you know, admittedly my own preference for numismatic design tends towards simplicity, you know, with more negative space, um, you know, and just just trying to make a design as elegant as simple and so forth but obviously in, the, in this case the simplicity was not quite you know what you were looking for in that case and you know the ultimate design obviously worked very well but um you know, complication is a necessity sometimes you're right and, and i agree like my preference is for simple designs too so i was i was kind of struggling against this I mean, the stakeholders from the Ghost Army, it was, seemed very important to them that these four different types of deception be sort of all represented. And so I took that to heart. The, the, the saving grace here was that we're talking about a three inch or one and a half inch metal, which is really kind of the biggest format that we get to use a, as AIP designers. So like, like I said, there's room for me to play there a little bit more. And I thought I can probably get away with this being a, a more detailed design just from the nature of the size of the format. If this was a one ounce gold coin, I would never have put that complicated of a design on it. Even if even if that's what the stakeholders wanted, I would have simplified it some way, you know? So good point. Yeah. Um, Any other questions or comments before Justin continues? Uh, I had a question. Sure, go Justin. ahead. Luke. Yeah, um, hi Justin, it's been a while. Uh, we are on the AIP together. Um, I guess oh, it's yeah, probably about really. 20 years ago. So um, yeah. yeah, I really like uh, your work. You've done a great job over the years. And um, thanks for sharing so much uh, interesting information. Uh, the question I had for you is, um, do you feel, what, what do you feel is the biggest challenge of designing in a circle? Whereas, you know, most of your sources are coming from print, which is square edges. And um, how, in your mind, how do you reapply those, those images into a circular format where it still looks um, visually appealing? No, that's a great question. And, it, and it's something I really struggled with at the beginning. I mentioned those first few years, I was really struggling to to, to create a design that worked. And I think part of it was adapting from rectangles, you know, 
to the, a circular format. That's part of what I mentioned is like, you don't learn that right away. It doesn't come right away. You, and it's because it's a different thing for sure. You don't have those corners to kind of create, uh, you know, composing when you have corners or a rectangle or a square or something, it's just kind of different. And then you got to fit all this type in there too, right? Like the inscriptions, I love the inscriptions, but I also, you know, my bias is toward the image. And so if I can get away with a, just a few inscriptions or minimal inscriptions, that that's going to be my preference, to leave more room for the image. But that also leaves more responsibility on me that the image communicate, right? Because the, the inscriptions may not be there to, to help support that, the information. But I think that's a great question. Um, I, I don't know exactly what a good answer to that is, but I, I've come to really love the circular format. It, there's a certain sort of perfection about a circle, right? Mm -hmm. and, and it feels very, like I don't have a lot of space. There's no there's no space to waste, if that makes sense, right? Every every part of that um, field needs to be considered with what you're putting in there and and what you know what what Peter was saying, what, the space that you leave, the negative space, what you don't put in is just as important as what you do put in. So that's always a consideration, you know. Okay, great. Thanks. Yeah. Okay, I, I like that. No space to waste. I might have to quote you on that at some point. Yeah. Yeah, so I, I'm very curious now to hear about the development of this uh, 2017 American Liberty design, which I, I just love. So please go ahead. Great. I'm glad I, I'm glad I picked this one. So yeah, I wanted to talk about this one, uh, partly because it received the most media attention by far of any coin program I've worked on. And I think that widespread interest was due to the historical significance of it being the first representation of Lady Liberty as a non-Caucasian woman on an American coin. Um, its unveiling came at a time of heightened debate in the country over questions of equality and representation in government and media. And many people, myself included, viewed this new liberty as kind of an encouraging symbol of hope and a recognition of that diverse national heritage that we share. But I, I certainly can't take credit for the idea. It was suggested previously by members of the CEA, CIA, CCAC and there were even designs submitted for the 2015 American Liberty High Relief Gold Coin that cast Lady Liberty as an African-American woman. So the, the concept we were challenged uh, to consider and explore for that, for that coin was to broaden and rethink the scope of what our ideas about, uh, the scope of our ideas about who Lady Liberty is and how she might reflect our nation today. Um, the selected design for the 2015 gold coin was certainly not a radical break with the past, but it was meant to, fight, uh, meant to signify something of an aesthetic shift away from the classical, uh, more traditional images of Lady Liberty. Uh, for the 2017 Liberty, the design requirements also noted that it should build upon the new modern aesthetic established by the 2015 coin, quote, exploring this allegory of liberty beyond its classical tradition. Uh, the task order encouraged us, uh, encouraged the exploration of that possibility of represented, of presenting her with a different ethnicity. And so it seemed to me that the requested close up portrait format could bring further clarity and emphasis to that identity. Usually, a, a bullseye or centered composition is, is not generally desirable because it's tendency toward that static symmetry. Um, but the nature of a high relief coin offers an incentive to locate those key details close to the center because you can get a deeper a cut in the, in the relief of the coin. So uh, this project recalled for me some of the artwork of artists um, who have shaped my sensibilities in really formative ways artistically. Of course, Italian Renaissance masters like Botticelli, Michelangelo, and they were influenced in turn by classical Greek and Roman coins and sculptures, many of which had been freshly unearthed and viewed for the first time in a thousand years during, during the Renaissance. Also, I love the, the 19th century French and English academic painters like Bouguereau, Alma Tadema, um, and John William Waterhouse. They seem to know how to portray almost these sort of regal qualities in the otherwise ordinary women who modeled for them. Like so many artists before, they adorned their female subjects with ribbons and circlets and laurel wreaths of floral crowns. Personally, I love how they captured this sort of serenity and nobility and grace of their subjects in the facial expressions and bodily gestures 
bringing out those queenly um, beauty and the divine nature of this feminine, the feminine power. Um, the, you know, you, you kind of see this, this profile of, of this noble uh, figure, right? In, in many different works that Sar John Singer Sargent, J.C. Leyendecker, um, they portrayed women as strong and fearless with, with a light of intelligence and a spiritual kind of life force shining from within. And we can see how Norman Rockwell used this sim similar profile with a simple portrait of this young girl as the focal point for his powerful narrative composition. Ruby Bridges here is cast as kind of a saintly icon contrasting her, her skin tones with the pure white dress and the pale uh, concrete wall. I also looked at the various representations of Lady Liberty throughout American history, uh, paying attention to her clothing, facial expressions, and gestures. I thought about why the artists chose to represent her the way they did, considering the purpose and context of their work. As I started to imagine a new portrait, I kept running into the idea of Libertas as the goddess of liberty, the queen, and the only royalty this, this nation, governed by and for the people, would ever require. I thought of the, those simple, beautiful British crowns featuring profiles of Queen Victoria and Elizabeth II, the, the sort of stately feminine grace and elegant curves of the hair and the neck and the crown jewels and the laurel wreaths, right? I also thought about similar designs by great American sculptors, Daniel Chester French, uh, Adolph Weinman, James Earl Fraser, James Long Longacre, Augustus St. Gaudens, and Hiram Powers. I also remembered some of these lovely pieces by Victorian English sculptors, Charles Calverley and Henry Weeks. I stumbled on these powerful pieces by Theodore Bonev, a contemporary Bulgarian sculptor, and some really fine work by French American artist, Philippe de Ferrat. So with these images in mind, I was starting to get a sense of the aesthetic qualities I wanted the, my Lady Liberty to have. Here's some examples of the thumbnail sketches I drew at the beginning of the project. My theory was that if, and is, that if I can make a clear, compelling, and appealing composition at the actual size of the coin, then the rest is just a matter of adding and refining details uh, as I scale it up. One of the ideas I was exploring was to portray Lady Liberty as a Native American woman. In fact, I hired two different uh, Native American models to pose in my studio, wearing the same Greek style chiton I had made from my 2015 Liberty design. Um, I reached out, I also reached out to Tessa, who's a young African American woman from my neighborhood. She had previously modeled with her brother and sister for my 2014 civil rights commemorative. And I was able to persuade her to return to the studio, pose for Lady Liberty. And she was just lovely and poised and radiant. Um, so she kind of became the inspiration for this design. With the due date approaching, I realized I would probably have only time to bring one of my two initial design concepts to a final rendering. So I started with the one that I felt had the most potential. Working with a few of my favorite shots from that photo shoot with Tessa, I developed more detailed preliminary sketches. I had her posed wearing a laurel wreath, but I thought it might be better uh, to replace that with some other kind of headwear to help differentiate the design from the 2015 coin. As you can see from the sketches, uh, I was still experimenting with the kind of sunburst style crown that, that we see on the Statue of Liberty. But I remembered having seen a few sketches by James Longacre of Lady Liberty in a Phrygian cap or eagle crested helm with a ring of stars encircling her brow. I was impressed by this image and on further research, I discovered it to be very similar to the Statue of Freedom by Thomas Crawford, which adorns the dome of the US Capitol. I thought there was something really special about that crown of stars, but the battle helm and eagle crest felt kind of superfluous in the context of this coin, kind of like too much on, on headgear, right? The Phrygian cap also seemed to fall into that category of richly meaningful yet old and perhaps outmoded symbols that the majority of Americans unfortunately wouldn't recognize or understand today. So I thought it would be better to place the stars on a simple circlet and keep her hair visible. This turned out to be a good decision because I was drawn to these images of beautiful 
uh, braids, these rope style braids uh, worn by many women of African descent. Um, it's, you know, each braid is kind of a discreet rope of hair twisted together. And to me, this, this felt both classical and contemporary at the same time. So this was a detail that I latched onto that I really wanted to include. And I felt like it could help signify her ethnicity in a really unambiguous way. With these images coming together uh, and these elements, I started on my final drawings. This, this one was photographed at an early stage, but this was my actual final drawing. I made some changes to the features, but um, to get it to this point, um, I hadn't done the, the crown yet, and I knew I might have some trouble really getting those stars accurate and given the sense of three dimensional, same size and turning away from the viewer on a, on a encircling band on her head. So I actually set the drawing aside and started to construct these stars using 3D software in Maya. It was relatively simple to make that sunburst style crown in case the stars didn't turn out looking quite like I had hoped, or if I decided to submit two different versions of the design. Uh, once I had that built, I kind of imported my drawing into an image plane to position the crown and then created a screenshot, which I used as a template for sketching over the stars uh, in Corel Painter, which is kind of a digital graphics program. I adapted the typography from my 2015 obverse design. And the, so the font here is Bitstream Amerigo for anybody who's a designer. And the reason I did this, I wanted some continuity. I, I was hoping that this design would be minted and I wanted them to feel like part of the series. So I kind of just used the same typography and adapted it. And that turned out to be the case with those. There was some, obviously some fine tuning and edits suggested by the mint for coinability and clarity, but I had that design and um, for the coin and metal versions, because this was, this was produced as a silver metal also. And as we know, the design went on to be recommended by both the, the CFA and the CCAC in their reviews. It was approved by the uh, Secretary of the Treasury at the time, Jack Liu. Uh, I do have another video I can play with. Uh, the speakers here are Elisa Basnight, uh, who was the US Mint Chief of Staff, and also uh, Se Secretary of Treasury at the time, Jack Liu. What this coin symbolizes for me personally, and perhaps all of you will have your own significant interpretation, is the evolution of liberty. Liberty is a representation of how anything is possible. Lady Liberty, as depicted in coinage throughout the years, is modeled after our society's continued evolution. As we as a nation continue to evolve, so does Liberty's representation. It reflects our nation's earliest days, still struggling to bring people and perspectives together while holding steadfast to our founding principles of freedom and independence. This is a history that began in the early 1770s with Jefferson, Washington, and Hamilton, recognizing the need for a unified national currency. Artist Jessen Kuhns observed that the introduction of this image provides the opportunity to explore the rich heritage of our nation. The crown of stars borrows from the Statue of Freedom on top of the U.S. Capitol and represents the traditional hopeful ideals of liberty while offering a hint of the possibilities that the future may hold. All right, I see we're getting a, a, little, a little late on the time. I, I don't know if we need to end right at noon, but uh, I... No, you're, it, it's fine, it's fine. I, I can take some more questions. I, the next slide is just this... Um, fun quote from Karim Abdul-Jabbar, who was actually a member of the CCAC at the time. He says, this is a bold and refreshing course for the Mint. The coin is a fitting symbol for the 225th anniversary of the U.S. Mint. I love how they replace the wreath across her head with large stars to represent a hopeful future as we strive to fulfill the promise of the U.S. Constitution. So that, that's, you know, one of, the, one of those bucket list things you never dream of that Karim Abdul-Jabbar okay. is going to talk about one of your designs. <laughs> um, I see there's a question from James about the 250th anniversary in 2026. I can't speak for what the Mint is doing, so I have to defer you to them. Uh, yeah, I, actually, I, I can just answer that briefly. So there is a semi-quincentennial program. And in fact, on Monday and Tuesday of this week, uh, we had a two-day CCAC meeting to review 
uh, some initial portfolios uh, for the dime for two out of the five quarters, as well as for the half dollar. Um, we critiqued the designs. The designs uh, will be reworked, some of them, and then presented to us again in October. So if you're curious uh, to have a sneak peek, um, you can go to the uh, CCAC's website, that's ccac.gov, as well as the U.S. Mint's website, um, where you can find um, probably in the next week or so, um, uh, uploaded information about that meeting, as well as uh, some of the uh, designs. And um, there were also um, members of the numismatic press attending that meeting. So I'm sure you could find information about that as well on um, some of the numismatic press um, uh, publications like Coin News and so forth. Um, so, um, Justin, I have to say, I'm really fascinated also by the, the process uh, for developing this. And I, I had also been very uh, curious about the origin of the stars on Liberty's head, as well as whether or not um, you actually had designs that coin from a live model. And so those questions that I had about that design particularly, you know, have been answered. Um, Does she have one? She have I, one? Yeah, I believe that's a good question. I, I mean, I typically get them, I, I don't know if she has the gold, but I, I typically will get them a silver medal if they're the model, I, like if it's a silver or bronze, but that's a good question. They need to, I think I did. I think I gave her one. I if I was story. her, I would put it on a necklace and wear it every day of my yeah. life. <laughs> <laughs> well, no, I mean, it, you probably know this, the mint doesn't want like a living person to appear on a coin or medal. So we always have to make it look like a little different mm -hmm. from our models. Yeah. Uh, there is a question in the chat here. Are the designs submitted as drawings or does the artist make <clears throat> a presentation of the design? Sorry. Well, so so what I showed you, uh, those black and white line line art drawings, they're, they, that's how they're submitted. That's how they're reviewed. That's, that's what I give the mint. And so basically all the decisions are made at that <laughs> level. And once the design is approved, then um, the mint handles the sculpting and engraving. But but that's only with the approved designs. I don't think they spend any time or trouble sculpting the relief until those designs have been approved by the Treasury Secretary. I, the, the artists don't really get to present. We don't go to the committees and pitch our designs or anything. We just submit them to the mint. We do the feedback. And then the mint handles it from there. It's really out of our hands and in, into the hands of the review bodies and committees. And, they never even ask us. I mean, our our. I mean, obviously, we're cheerleading for our designs, but we're doing that quietly from our own corner. You know. Yeah, Justin, I had a question for you about um, your drawings. Once you submit them, um, have there been any occasions where you've been surprised by the the results or the final uh, coin, the way it turns out? As opposed to, because obviously there's, they're, they're actually making a relief of a drawing. So you go from two dimensions into three dimensions. Um, have you always thought that they've transferred your visual information, how you uh, visualize the design? Um, or were you ever disappointed by any of them? I know earlier in the presentation, you said that um, they made you omit some of your images. You thought that more for the ghost army, not all, you thought that there should have been more information um, or more images included. Um, how about um, the technical approach as to how they translated your overall design? Have you always been pretty much satisfied or, or have there been any occasions where you thought something wasn't quite right? Yeah, no, yeah. I mean, that's, a, that's a bit of a loaded question, but... Um... <laughs> I, I mean, I've been really pleasantly surprised um, with the final results. I mean, the Mint, they know what they're doing. They're competent, right? It goes through many stages of review. Um, so, sometimes it's like not how I pictured it, but but it's, it's, a, it's, a, it's an interpretation. It's another artist's take on that. And I get that. And, and I accept that part of the process, right? Like I know that this is not unless I'm sculpting it, which I'm not invited to do, it's not ever going to look exactly like I had in mind. So I'm happy when it's in, in the ballpark, you know? I mean, honestly, I'll give a shout out to Phoebe Hemphill. On my first slide, like all those four designs, those are Phoebe's. 
Um, I mean, not, not the designs, the sculpts. And I think, and not, not to play favorites, but I'm always really happy when I find out she's sculpting my design because I think she gets me and she gets my design and she has an ability to really translate it um, the way that I see it. So uh, the other sculptors and engravers are phenomenal. I mean, I loved uh, Eric Custer's uh, Rosie the Riveter. I was just floored by how he sculpted that. It's so beautiful. I just, it was amazing. I hadn't really seen his work before, but now I'm hoping he'll just sculpt one of mine. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, and um, one one aspect of uh, the sculpting too is that um, some of the uh, people who work at the Mint, like Phoebe, still continue to sculpt in plaster. Mm -hmm. uh, others are using various um, CAD design type programs to sculpt, you know, on on the computer, essentially in three dimensional. So there are different ways of sculpting that two dimensional design. And in fact. Um, that it was a really interesting question, Bill, because uh, it was uh, something I've been very curious about as well, too, because um, many of the artists uh, who design coins today um, are working in two dimension rather than in three dimension. So th these are designs that are initially in some way conceived essentially as two dimension, although it will eventually be three dimension. And Justin... You mentioned that you don't sculpt these coins, obviously, but do you sculpt um, at all? And um, do you work in three-dimension or is it primarily two-dimension trying to think of how that will translate into three-dimension? That's a great question. The I'll never, I never have sculpted the re final relief, but I have done what I call maquettes, uh, like a small clay sculpture. For example, the uh, I didn't include a photograph of this, but for the uh shawnee national forest uh design it was this pile of rocks right is camel rock the sort of iconic thing i actually sculpted a little small model of that rock formation about about this big hmm. mainly because i couldn't travel to shawnee national forest it was i didn't have the time or the resources to do that and i i wanted to use that iconic image but again, and there were a lot of photographs of it, but again, I couldn't just draw based on someone else's photograph because of copyright issues. And really, I kind of wanted a, an upshot. I wanted to see the rocks from below. And there's just, you'd have to get a drone and probably fly it out over the trees to get that angle because I don't think you could walk out to the position I wanted to show it. I wanted to be recognizable, but I didn't want it to just look like the photograph. So I used those photographs to get information about the form and the shape and the proportions of that rock formation, but then I sculpted it. And that allowed it me allowed me then to put, to light it the way I wanted to kind of get, and I photographed it like it was a model, right? You know, mm -hmm. from, from below. And it, again, it gave me the angle that I wanted without actually having to be there, right? Um, and, and I showed you some of those uh, 3D models, the, the in Maya and ZBrush, you know, that inflatable tank. I, I that for me, that sculpture, even though it's happening digitally, right? So, so that's part of my process, but it's usually like the input, you know, it's those observational studies and sketches that help me get to a good two-dimensional design, which then gets interpreted and relief if it's selected. Um, any other questions? Uh, Chuck, your hand's raised. Um, Justin, it's such a pleasure. And my comments would only mimic what the others have said, but not nearly as eloquently. But I wanted to tell you that in 2017, the Early American Coppers Club held their annual convention in Philadelphia. John Krelovich arranged a, a private tour for us at the Mint, about 15, 17 of us or so. And we actually went into one of the coining rooms where a very large man was creating your 2017 silver medals. And my wife looked at it so intently and she said, Chuck, this is elegant. Are you going to be buying one? I said, honey, we've already had our order in at the Mint. <laughs> we are so proud to have that medal. And I am so proud. My wife is proud to have that medal in our collection. And it's just been a pleasure to hear you speak. Thank you for your presentation. Thank you so much. It means a lot. It, I, it really does. Every person I talk to who was, you know, has had an experience with one of those coins, one of the designs, uh, and when I hear that, it it makes it it makes it even more real, right? It's not just an object; it's it's a person to person, human to human communication of something special, something sacred, something beautiful. 
and that's what I'm trying to do is is to say something about humanity that you know America is good even with all our fault faults um, I wouldn't do this if I didn't believe that if I didn't love this country and want to express that it, you know recognizing that, that there are problems but but putting forward some kind of beauty some kind of art that inspires us to remember our ideals you know um so it means it means so much to hear that i, I thank you for saying that well you have certainly succeeded in our family yes thank you again thank you very well said justin are there any other uh, questions or comments all right well justin i have to thank you again this was an absolutely wonderful presentation um i've really enjoyed it i'm sure those of us joining us today and those who will see it on YouTube will enjoy it just as much.